say this city has 10 million souls. Some are living in mansions, some are living in holes. Yet there's no place for us, my dear. Yet there's no place for us. Once we had a country and we thought it fair. Look in the atlas and you'll find it there. We cannot go there now, my dear. We cannot go there now. Those words were written by W. H. Auden in 1939. In his poem, Refugee Blues, he sought to capture the despair that thousands of Jewish people felt as they were trying to flee Nazi Germany because their homeland had betrayed and rejected them. While some would find safe haven in other countries, most remained trapped. And the loss and displacement expressed in Auden's poem is also shared by millions of people today who have been forced to flee their homes in order to survive. Thank you for joining us for today's Stay Connected Live program. I'm your host, historian Edna Friedberg. Today's program commemorates World Refugee Day. We will discuss the experiences of Jewish people fleeing the Nazis during the Holocaust and some of the challenges that refugees continue to face around the world in our day. I'm very pleased to be joined by my colleague, Ron Coleman, who is the chief of the library for the Holocaust Museum. Good morning, Ron. Good morning, Edna, and hi, everyone. Nice to see you. And we will also be hearing rep from representatives at HIAS, an American Jewish organization that helped Jews during the Holocaust and now continues to assist refugees all around the world. During the show, please send us your questions for Ron by posting them in the comments section. We'll get to as many as we can in the course of the live discussion. Now, it is estimated that today there are more than 100 million people who have been forced out of their homes in trying to escape war or violent persecution. And I know as a historian, and we know that Holocaust history can help us to better understand their experiences, to put it into some context. So Ron, let's step back in time and examine how the Nazi rise to power in Germany led many European Jews to try to leave their countries. Could you walk us through that quickly? Sure. So as our visitors know, and as our viewers know, after Hitler came into power in 1933, anti-Jewish attacks and laws were implemented across Germany. Um, long before Jews were sent to the killing centers, their lives were upended by the Nazis. Uh, restrictions were imposed on the work that they could perform, the schools that Jews could, could attend, uh, when and where they could go shopping or even walk down the street. Eventually, Jews were stripped of their citizenship in Germany and were forced to, many forced to flee to leave their home and leave their possessions behind. We know that between 1933 and 1939, more than 90,000 German and Austrian Jews fled to neighboring countries like France and Belgium or the Netherlands. Uh, after the war began in 1939, leaving became much more difficult. Nazi Germany technically allowed people to emigrate, to leave the country until November 1941. Uh, but there were very few countries around the world who were willing to accept refugees. The world really uh, did not recognize the danger that these Jews faced under Nazism. And did not recognize or did not want to recognize or acknowledge um, that they were being targeted, um, not only specifically targeted for persecution, but also coupled with the economic depression, um, anti-Semitism, uh, xenophobia, fear of strangers in the U.S. around the world. It was all a perfect storm that made it especially difficult for German and Austrian Jews to find any country that was willing to take them in. And as a result, those who managed to often did so with help. Who provided assistance? So a, a typical uh, refugee fleeing Nazism would not have been able to navigate the, the challenges of, the, of, of trying to find a new country on their own. Um, when we think of refugees in the 1930s, we are talking about people who were fleeing persecution, but they did not have this kind of legal, international legal protection for asylum seekers that we have today. That came about much later, after the war. Um, but assistance to Jews, those who were trying to help, uh, uh, um, those who were trying to flee, came from a number of aid organizations. Some of these organizations were, were motivated not just by religion, but also a long-standing commitment to help people in need. Sympathetic individuals, individual um, uh, you know, citizens in the United States were willing to take responsibility for refugees, stepped up also. 
uh, and they played a vital role, especially for those who were trying to flee to the United States. Uh, in some cases, this meant writing a guarantee and, and perhaps even um, putting up money to guarantee to take care of a refugee when they arrived in the country that they uh, um, hoped to stay in. Um, and often these individuals worked with these organizations and these organizations coordinated with individuals to try to help refugees who were fleeing. And we've been talking about this so far in a really abstract way, but of course, every situation had its specifics, its difficulties, its challenges, its lucky opportunities. And I'd like us to turn um, to put a face on this and to a family that lived for many generations in the German town of Ludwigshafen. How did the refugee odyssey begin for who was then a young boy named Richard Weilheimer? Sure. So the, this plump little toddler that you see here, this is Richard Weilheimer. Uh, he was born in 1931 into a long established Jewish family in Ludwigshafen. His family had no reason to believe that they would not remain in Ludwigshafen for many generations more. But after Hitler rose to power, the Weilheimers and all the other Jewish families in their community were immediately at risk. Here you see Richard with his parents, Lily and Max Weilheimer. His little brother Ernst on the left was born in 1935. In November of 1938, just before Richard's seventh birthday, his parents woke up the boys one night and told them to dress, dress quickly. Richard saw, remember seeing Jewish neighbors pulled from their homes and beaten in the street. Uh, before his family could even leave, a mob broke into their house and Richard's father, Max, was arrested and sent to the concentration camp of Dachau. They were not able to stop even to grab sweaters or coats on that cold night. Uh, but Lily took her children, Richard and Ernst, who was then just two years old, and tried to find uh, a help among the community. We know that night now by the name Kristallnacht. Um, that night of the pogroms and attacks on Jews across Germany uh, and Austria um, kicked off and intensified a refugee crisis that um, would resonate around the world. Back to the Weilheimers, that night Lily took her, her, her children um, and went house to house to try to find a, a family members and friends who could help to take them in. But she found that there was actually no safe place for them. Many of the other men in the family had also been arrested. Knowing that there was no other place to go, she went back to her home and found that it had been ransacked. Their furniture was in splinters. The treasured possessions, including a family photo album, had been gashed with knives and axes. The rioters even poured ink and molasses over clothes and linens to destroy them. Richard, decades later, would remember that the smell of molasses would take him back to the terror of that night. They hid in an attic, Richard Ernst and their mother hid in an attic for several days and a Catholic neighbor stepped in to bring them food. Eventually the family was able to be reunited when Richard's father, Max, was released from the camp about five weeks later, but they never felt safe in their home again. Just in an intense trauma, like the, the world opened, you know, the ground opened up and was not steady anymore. Um, Ron, I'd like to pause for a moment because we have people writing in to tell us where they're watching from all around the country and all around mm -hmm. the world. Uh, good morning to our viewers here in the U.S., including those in Atlanta, Georgia, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and Bovey, Minnesota. And a warm welcome also to our viewers tuning in from countries including Ecuador, Israel, Brazil, Argentina, and Portugal. And to our Portuguese viewers, I'd like to note that we'll be talking in, um, at great length about Portugal later in the show, so please stay with us. Uh, so, Ron, after the, the trauma and the violence of November 1938 of Kristallnacht, um, just under two years later, in October 1940, the townspeople of Ludwigshafen, um, where the Weilheimers lived, um, the Jewish townspeople were rounded up by the German authorities wholesale. What happened to Richard and his family? Well, we're telling the story about one family, but it's important to also remember that this is a, a, a microcosm of a larger refugee experience. But to the Weilheimer's specific story, Richard remembers that they were given only an hour to pack up um, anything they could take and were only given, uh, allowed one suitcase. There was no room to pack any games or toys. Um, remember Richard's about nine years old at this point. They could only take the necessities. Um, 
this again is a common sort of refrain of the refugee experience, especially for children. About 40% of the world's refugees right now are estimated to be children. And children have to give up a sense of safety and a sense of normalcy. That certainly happened for Richard and his brother Ernst. The family was deported by train into southern France. Um, there, the French Vichy regime, which collaborated with the Nazis, had set up a, 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 an internment camp called Gours that was run by the French. Um, this is not the concentration camps that we think of in terms of Auschwitz or, or Buchenwald, but this was a terrible place. Um, at Gours, Max, the father, was separated from his wife and children. They were able to stay together because women and children were kept together in one part of the camp. But really, the French were unprepared for this, this, the numbers of, of, of people who had been deported, that the Germans deported there. The living conditions in the camp were terrible. There was not enough food. The camp became a muddy pit. Uh, Richard remembers see, seeing people dying almost every day. He has a specific memory, had a specific memory of seeing people frozen in the mud who had tried to make it to the latrines at night because the temperatures were below freezing. They had family who um, lived in the United States and Max and Lily tried to reach out to them to, to, to help them get to the United States, but they were not able to get the necessary visas to join them before this deportation had occurred. And in addition to the terrible living conditions, the feeling of uncertainty, um, the family suffered another blow because Lily became quite ill uh, at Gours um, with what turned out to be breast cancer. How did her condition and her deterioration lead to a life-changing decision that these parents had to make? Well, um, Lily, there was really no way to, to treat something like breast cancer in a place like Gours. Um, she became increasingly ill. Max and, and Lily heard that the Quakers, the American Friends Service Committee, um, which had an office in southern France, operating out of Marseille and around southern France, um, were taking groups of children from Gores to an orphanage not far away. And Max and Lily sought to, to place their children there. Max, uh, Richard and Ernst were chosen to take, be taken to this orphanage, and they left Gores in February of 1941. Um, the parents clung to hope that this would just be temporary, that they would be able to be released from the camp, perhaps with visas to the United States, perhaps somewhere else, and the family could be reunited. But Lily died about five months after the children left. Um, this is a handmade memorial certificate that was made for her in Gours. She was beloved. Max estimates that, estimated that about 500 people attended her funeral in the camp. What a devastating way to die. Um, what a devastating place to die. And with Lily gone and the situation becoming more and more dire for Jewish people all across Europe, what did Max, the father, try next in order to make sure that his sons would be safe? Sure. So um, Richard and Ernst were certainly in a better position in, in the orphanage, but they were not safe. Um, here you can see them. They're the first two um, boys on the left. And this is a 1942 photo in the orphanage. Max was convinced that the children would not be safe until he could get them out of Europe. Um, he heard that the Quakers, the American Friends Service Committee, were organizing transports of children from southern France to come to the United States unaccompanied. Um, and he lobbied the Quakers to allow his kids to be part of it. Um, these photographs that you see here were taken as part of their application process. The Quakers wrote extensive documentation about the family in Germany, about the boys' personalities. They described Richard as being the thinker of the two and Ernst as the leader. And also wrote about the relatives in the United States who would be able to care for them once they arrived. And to be clear, even if they could be chosen for this, make it through the process of immigration, all the hurdle, they were going to be going without their father. Um, Correct. Kids alone. Correct. That was the 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 rule in place that the parents had to follow the normal immigration procedure. There was no asylum or refugee policy at the time. The United States had to go through the normal immigration procedure. But the Quakers and other aid organizations, including the Joint Distribution Committee and, and others, were organizing these child transports to bring children by themselves. But even that wasn't necessarily straightforward because you have these two boys, brothers, Richard and Ernst. Mm -hmm. And there was a moment when Richard feared that he would not be allowed to travel with his brother to the U.S., right? Uh, correct. So 
because of the poor conditions in the camp and, and even as well treated as they were in the orphanage, it was still difficult and they faced malnutrition. Um, Richard had sores all over his body, including the soles of his feet that were just not healing. He also had a contagious skin condition that you can actually see in this photo on the side of his cheek. Either of those illnesses could have prevented from being accepted by American immigration officials. Um, we know from the documentation that the Quakers downplayed this in, in their writing, and they hoped that Richard would heal in time for the voyage. In order to do that, they placed Richard in quarantine. Already, the boys had been separated from their parents, but they had each other. Now they were separated from each other. Their mother was dead, which they had learned that their mother had died, and they were separated from each other. And Richard would later write about how terrified he was to be away from Ernst and how um, worried he was of what would happen next. Uh, thankfully, Richard recovered sufficiently that he, he was allowed to make the trip and come to the U.S. Um, but um, his father, Max, must have been so relieved to know that both of his sons were eventually bound for what he hoped would be a destination where they could exhale, a final destination. What do we know about the father's last visit with his sons before the ship set sail? Sure. So um, we know that Max was able to get a, actually a pass to leave the girls' camp to visit the boys just days before they left. Um, it would be their last visit together. He hoped to see this, the boys one last time. He hoped to see them as they got on the ship to leave Marseille in June of 1942. But, and he made it to the, to the, the, the pier, but there was a big crowd of people there and he was not able to, they were not able to find each other. Richard would later write that there would be no embraces, no more goodbyes, no kisses, only tears known to me and an unresponding God. Max, their father, was crushed by the experience. He was making this conscious decision to send his children away, and he had hoped for one last chance to see them. Um, he wrote a letter of gratitude for what the Quakers were able to do for his boys, and he said that in that moment when he realized he couldn't see them one last time that his heart broke. So at age 10, Richard Walheimer and his younger brother Ernst left behind everyone they knew in the world and boarded a ship bound for the United States. It just as, as a mother, not as a historian, but as a mother of boys here, I just can't imagine searching for each other on the pier that day, you know, hoping for one last hug and, and not getting that chance. Um, it's just, it's devastating. And the selflessness of Max, um, you know, we're all somebody's child and it, it mm -hmm. makes me cry. Um, what th this, le I'm curious about the letter. What more did Max say in this letter that he wrote to the, the aid workers? Well, Max was a beautiful writer. Um, and he clearly loved his sons deeply. Um, the line is devastating. The, the letter is devastating on every line. Um, he wrote that he hoped his children, quote, will never, despair, never in their lives have to submit again to so much unhappiness. He ended the letter by saying that they had had a family life of rare happiness and contentment. Unfortunately, it was too short. It's just the tragedy of it, the, the pointlessness of it, because it didn't have to be this way. This was a, a man-made tragedy. Um, we have a couple of viewer comments of people responding to the, the family's story, Ron. Um, mm -hmm. A woman named Carol writes, these are beautiful children escaping with the aid of caring individuals. And there are many such stories like this during World War II. Carol, absolutely right. Mm -hmm. um, these are just two of, of millions. And from um, a viewer named Julia, saying, I'm so sorry that their parents didn't make it due to the treatment they received. My prayers for them and the countless others who could not survive. Um, Ron, several people, including uh, viewers named Jim and Sharon, are asking if Richard and Ernst were adopted. And I'm, I'm glad that they're asking this because it's easy to think of this as some kind of happy ending. You know, they set sail to America and it's all great. Um, what happened to them next? How did Richard describe it? Well, I mean, it's a it's a it's a common refrain of refugee stories throughout history, really, that, you know, the there's rarely a, a clear, happy ending to a story. Um, for the cases of Richard and Ernst, when they made it to the United States, they were actually placed with relatives, with distant relatives. But because those relatives were not well established, they had to be um, separated. Uh, we know that Richard ended up with one aunt and Ernst ended up 
with another. Here you see Richard um, just two years after he arrived in America. Um, he's 13. Here he is celebrating his bar mitzvah. This is 1944. Um, in his memoir, Richard would write about that adjustment of, of life in the United States in 1942. Um, for all of their lives, the boys had had each other to cling to. And Richard, as the older brother, felt the responsibility for his younger brother and their father, Max, had, had invested his son, Richard, with that responsibility. Um, once they arrived in the United States and they were placed with, with families, but separated, um, Richard would later write that he felt that it was a betrayal of his father's last request for them to stay together. And of the nearly 50 Jewish children who moved from the Gours camp um, initially into that children's home, uh, along with Richard and Ernst, every one of them became an orphan. Uh, later, the French government would turn over the Jews interned at Gours, uh, including Max, uh, their father. And we know now from documentation that Max was deported to the Sobibor Killing Center, and he did not survive the Holocaust. Richard and Ernst and these other kids were so young to have lost so much. And it's really difficult to comprehend or to even uh, describe how much loss and trauma refugees experience. Um, we spoke to partners of ours at HIAS, um, a nonprofit originally known as the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society, now HIAS. Um, and uh, a woman who works there named Rachel Levitan explains just how profound that trauma can be. One of the pieces that is lost on us is the loss of identity. Um, you know, you leave behind as a refugee, a very complex life, your work, your connection to synagogue or church, your kid's school community, your home that you've lived in for many years, family members that you've lost, and suddenly you're on the move and it's you and maybe one or two family members if you're lucky and it's a suitcase and you're just moving to desperately find a place of safety. And the loss is not just of all of those things that make up your life, but to others, you are the refugee. You're not the complex human being that you were when you were back at home. So many layers of, of um of trauma, loss of identity, loss of status, even that we're talking about them as refugees, just putting this label on somehow strips away the complexity of a human being. And we're hearing from many viewers for whom this story feels very resonant and personal. Uh, a woman named Mireille writes, hello from Freeport, New York. We escaped France in 1940 with the help of relatives and Hyas. Mm -hmm. And another viewer named Barbara says, my mother was helped by highest director Gaynor Jacobson when she wanted to immigrate to the U.S. in 1948. He convinced the Hungarian authorities to allow her to leave. Were not for this man and highest, I would not be here. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you, Murray. And um, just speaking personally, I can also relate. A another American Jewish aid organization, the Jewish Joint Distribution Committee, helped my father um, to, to survive, fed him and paid his rent in the years right after uh, the Holocaust. And I also would not be here if the joint had not uh, taken care of him and helped him to uh, recover and eventually to come to the US. So we owe huge debts of gratitude to these, uh, to these wonderful organizations. Ron, I'd like to turn now to another Jewish refugee though from that time, from the, the 1930s and 40s who managed to survive by leaning on his musical talents as he fled from Germany to first one country and then another and another. Please introduce us to Ferris Farago. Sure, I'm very um, happy actually to introduce you because you know, in my work with archival collections and, and stories here at the museum, I've come to know lots of these refugee stories uh, intimately. Um, certainly the Weilheimer story has always resonated with me, but Ferris, story does as well um, and illustrates different aspects of the refugee experience at that time. So Ferris, um, his original name was Friedrich Goldstein, but I'm going to call him Ferris. That was his stage name. Uh, he was born in 1903 in Istanbul um, to Jewish parents. He, when he was a child, his family moved to Berlin where he attended school and grew up. So unlike the Weilheimers who were well established in Ludwigshafen, uh, Ferris's family was newly arrived in Germany 
when at the time that that the Nazis rose to power. Ferris was a talented singer and he performed in nightclubs and tea houses across Berlin. In 1938, the Nazis forced him out of Germany, uh, not only because he was Jewish for sure, but also because he had worked with a socialist peace organization in the 1930s. But he was fortunate uh, to be, because he, as a musician, he could work anywhere that music could be appreciated. Uh, he continued performing in the Netherlands, in Belgium, and in England, important for his story. Uh, he was singing in variety shows. So he's moving from country to country to country. Um, was Ferris able to continue to stay a step ahead of the Nazis as they advanced throughout Europe? Because this is no longer just a, a German domestic threat. Correct. So we said earlier that about 90,000 Jews had fled to neighboring countries during the war. Ferris was among those. But as we know, the war expanded beyond, expanded Germany beyond its borders. Ferris was singing and entertaining audiences in England, as I mentioned. And he was about to hire a young uh, um, musician named Trixie Gardner. She was a British performer who, who danced and played the accordion um, to join his act. But Ferris had a visa that allowed him to stay in England only for a short amount of time as an entertainer. And when that visa expired, he had to return to mainland Europe. This is just before the outbreak of the war. Trixie joined him. They went to Antwerp, where they performed in an orchestra for, for about 10 months. During this time, Ferris and Trixie fell in love and they got engaged. Uh, just days before they were supposed to be due to be married, though, uh, in May of 1940, the Nazis interrupted Ferris's life again when the Germans invaded Belgium. Even though Antwerp was under German occupation, Ferris and Trixie were able to get married a few weeks later. Ferris kept his Jewish identity secret um, from his, the new occupying forces by pretending to be a Protestant Christian, just like his new wife, Trixie. Once they were married, they were both endangered. Um, by marrying a non-British man, Trixie actually gave up her citizenship, which means giving up the protection of her government. And they were both now in danger. So not exactly a, a honeymoon, a newlywed experience. Um, and several months later, they were actually able to leave, uh, to flee German-occupied Belgium. Um, tell us, how did they end up in Portugal? And what was life like for thousands of refugees who found shelter there? Sure. Well, so it turns out it's very good to have fans. Um, an employee at the consulate of El Salvador was a fan of Ferris and Trixie. He had seen their musical act several times. He was not able to get them a visa to El Salvador, but he was able to get a transit visa that would allow them to get to Portugal. Uh, and from there, hopefully they would be able to find uh, um, a, a place to move on to. So they made it to Lisbon. And Lisbon is a very important city for refugees in World War II because it was the westernmost port on mainland Europe. And at a certain point, it became the only port from which you could take a ship to get to North America. Uh, so tens of thousands of Jewish refugees fled through Lisbon. Many ended up staying in Lisbon for, for a time while they were trying to find a place to go. While they're there, the refugees were not permitted to work or attend school. So they weren't actually considered threats by the locals. In general, the Portuguese were very friendly to Jewish refugees. They offered them food and shelter. Um, the warm weather and beaches, as you can see here, I'm sure helped make the, the, the stay, stay more pleasant. But refugees still felt that they were clearly in danger. And again, they're part of a huge mass of people um, who are supposed to be treating Portugal as a way station, but um, are having difficulty finding somewhere to go. I'll say I have a special mm -hmm. soft spot uh, for Lisbon. Among the other Jewish refugees there from Belgium was a young couple with a, a tiny infant daughter, um, little baby, and she would grow up to become my husband's mother. Um, and they spent about a year in Lisbon um, waiting for visas. Um, Ferris and Trixie didn't have particular wealth or connections that would help them to get out of Portugal quickly though, and they had to stay and they were allowed to stay. Um, how did they in their particular way as musicians show their gratitude to the government and people of Portugal for permitting them to remain? Sure, so there were lots of refugee mus musicians in, in Portugal and in Lisbon. Um, 
And Ferris and Trixie wanted to um, display, show their gratitude to the Portuguese for the kindness and, and welcome that they had given. So they organized a special concert that brought together these refugee musicians and singers. The concert was called Obrigado a Portugal, or Thank You, Portugal. It was their way of saying thank you for the kindness that the Portuguese people had, had shown them. Here you can see some pages from the uh, program. It was a wide variety of performers. There were opera singers. There were concert pianists and dancers. There was even a ma magician. Here you see Trixie in the top right and Ferris in the bottom left. Uh, they sang a song, Ferris and Trixie. They wrote a song for this concert called Obrigado Portugal um, that wove throughout the word thank you in many different languages and included the line, it warms the heart to meet a friend before you meet your journey's end. So this was really their love letter to the people of Portugal. Uh, how was it received? Uh, the people of Portugal loved it. The government of Portugal did not. Uh, immediately after the concert, Ferris and Trixie were arrested. And to understand why, just quickly, it's important to know that Portugal was neutral during World War II. Um, that meant that there were representatives of the United States and England there because they were not necessarily allowed with, uh, allied with the Axis. But that also means that there were representatives of Nazi Germany because Portugal was not officially allied with the Allies either. The Germans were upset about this concert because they felt that it made Germany look bad because people were, uh, they were thanking the Portuguese for helping people fleeing from Germany. So to convince the German officials that the Portuguese were truly neutral, the Portuguese government arrested the concert organizers. Ferris and Trixie spent about 25 days in a very small cell together. They were eventually released and were sent to a small town outside of Lisbon called Caldas da Rainha to live with other refugees until they could find a permanent destination. Um, but even though the concert landed them in jail for a while and kind of in exile, it actually also gave them exposure that led to the lucky break they had been seeking, an opportunity to start over in a new country. What happened? How did that work out? Well, we know that there were all of the refugee aid ag agencies, everybody that we've talked about so far, the joint, um, highest, um, had operations in Lisbon that were assisting refugees there including the American Friends Service Committee. This is the Quakers. This is the same organization that organized the child transport that the Weilheimer children went on. Um, Ferris and Trixie became well known to the, to the Quakers and the Quakers started reaching out to, to um, connections in the United States and through their office in Philadelphia to try to find someone to sponsor Ferris and Trixie to come. Eventually they found that sponsor, but they still needed a lot of money to pay for the ship ticket. So Hyas, stepped in and actually paid for Ferris's ticket to come to the United States. The Quakers raised money from people across the US to try to pay for Trixie's ticket. And they finally sailed out of Portugal into the United States on December 18th, 1941, just a few weeks after Pearl Harbor. When they arrived, they changed their last name to Robbins, Ferris and Trixie Robbins, and they made their new home in Pittsburgh. They continued their musical careers. Almost immediately after they arrived, they started performing for the USO, um, entertaining American troops to boost morale of the armed forces. In December the following year, Trixie wrote to the, and to the aid workers of the American Friends Service Committee to thank them for all that they had done to help them. And we're looking here at this collect, this postcard that she sent them as a a thank you note where she recognized the life-saving work of the Quaker aid organization, said how happy they were uh, to spend their first Christmas in their new homeland. Um, we have a question from a, a viewer named Annalisa. She writes, so many of these sad and tragic stories. Why did we, and I think she means the US, wait so long before stepping in? Perhaps many Jewish families could have been spared. Can you offer some context for that, Ron? Well, sure, and Annalisa, you're, Annalisa, you're getting at the the core question that we're we're challenged when we study refugee stories of World War II and beyond, um, and that is, you know, couldn't somebody have helped? One of the important things to remember about the refugee experience at this time, again, World War II, is that there was no worldwide refugee policy. The world was not prepared to handle an influx and the need of people who were trying to flee Nazi Germany. Certainly the United States was not prepared, had no refugee policy, had an immigration system, but no refugee policy. 
it was not until after World War II, and as the stories of the camps came out and as the stories of, of survivors came to be known, that the world reflected on what had happened and what could have and should have been done by governments and others. And it was not until the 1950s that codified the Refugee Convention, um, uh, giving some sense of legal structure to asylum seekers who, who are seeking or are fleeing persecution. I think that's so important and it also um, speaks to intent because it's not exactly a failure of the United States or other countries if it was never their express purpose to, to serve that role for people. Um, it's not pleasant to think about it that way, but I think that is that is the reality is that often policy reflects values and we did not see ourselves as the, the world savior. Um, continues to be a debate today. How much is that our responsibility? Mm -hmm. And it shows that this is not just a history that is in a closed and dusty book. This is, these are stories that are important to study because they do resonate and challenge us today. So this is reflected not only in legal terms, but also sometimes in, in popular culture, this difficulty of leaving homes, trying to start lives in other countries. Um, during the period of the Holocaust and the war, a British author named Michael Bond witnessed many children passing through train stations in England without their parents. Um, Ron, tell us, how did that experience ex inspire, experience inspire Michael Bond to create the beloved fictional character of Paddington Bear? Yes, well, if you remember, and if the viewers remember the books or the movies, Paddington Bear arrived from Peru in London, unaccompanied, knowing no one. Um, he carried little that he could not fit into a single suitcase, only the clothes on his back and a tag around his neck. Um, the author said that his memories of the children he saw at the Reading train station during World War II inspired him to write Paddington stories, which was published in 1958. Um, he said that they all had a, a label around their neck and that reminded me exactly of these photographs that we see of, of children from the war who all had labels around their neck. Uh, Bond told the Guardian newspaper in 2014 that Paddington, in a sense, was a refugee. And this is a tag from our collection. Um, and again, when I thought, heard Bond's description of, of, of his inspiration for Paddington and the description of Paddington, I immediately thought of tags like this. This was worn by a refugee child who came on a transport similar to the transports for the Wildheimers during World War II. And in fact, if you look closely, you can actually see that this tag was, was um, produced by Hyatt. Bond would have seen children are being evacuated to the countryside to avoid German bombs. He may have also seen um, some of the ch Jewish children who arrived on the kinder transports in Great Britain. Uh, you know, 10,000 children came from Germany and Austria and Czechoslovakia to Great Britain in 1938 and 39. Uh, and that story lives on um, in books and in movies. The Paddington Bear story still resonates. Um, there's even a Ukrainian versions of the film in which Paddington is voiced by now President Volodymyr Zelensky. Actually, we have a, a clip of President Zelensky, then actor Volodymyr Zelensky, uh, recording the role of Paddington. Всем привет, дорогие друзья! Я Владимир Зеленский. Я подарил свой голос потрясающему, харизматичному, доброму медвежонку Паттингтону. Тетка Лёси завжди мрела про Лондон, та не мала змоги. Як би вона це побачила, то вважайте її мрія здійснилась. Тетка Люси! А, Паттингтон. And Vladimir Zelensky was, as I said, an actor when he did that voice. He could not have imagined that only a few years later uh, he would be president of his country and that war in his country would force millions of innocent people from their homes in search of safety. So there's a, a different poignancy looking at his Paddington Bear uh, in light of what's in the news today. Um, we also have a viewer named Kay writing in that for in Britain for Queen Elizabeth's Jubilee, uh, there was some kind of opening segment with her and Paddington Bear, um, mm -hmm. so that there is this model of, of taking in refugees and welcoming them. Um, it's more than just a cute children's story. Um, looking at President Zelensky, thinking about the many, many children uh, who are displaced currently, um, not only in and around Ukraine, but all around the world, 
um, from their homes in Syria, from their homes in Burma. Um, I'd like to talk to people, we've tried to talk to people who have been currently working with refugees now, and organizations like Hyas have been active on the ground in Ukraine. Uh, we were able to speak to a woman, woman named Olga Morkova, uh, who is a Hyas representative in Ukraine and an advocate for people displaced by the war. Let's hear what she had to say. Since Russia's invasion of Ukraine, almost 7 million people were forced to flee Ukraine to other countries, such as Poland, Romania, Moldova, and other countries in Europe, as well as the United States. Um, and over 7 million people were displaced internally. So they lost their homes and they had to move to other places inside Ukraine. Unfortunately, some of these people had to move few times because once they moved, then military action came again to their new place where they are and they had to move again. More than half of Ukraine's children were displaced in Ukraine. Many families got separated because men had to stay behind and defend country while mothers with children fled. By all accounts, crisis in Ukraine is the largest forced displacement crisis in Europe since the World War II. This is definitely a very traumatic experience for all of these people. It's devastation. And right now, people are in need of support. And again, it's not just from Ukraine, but also think about the many thousands of people who fled Afghanistan just at the end of last summer. Uh, unfortunately, it's a scene that we see repeated over and over. Um, so Ron, I wanna thank you very much for joining us today, for sharing these very, very moving stories um, that speak to the power of personal choices of life and death. And I hope that people feel moved and inspired by them. Thank you. Thank you, Adnan. Thank you all for joining us. I think it's safe to say that most and probably all of us can relate to the heartache that comes with having to say goodbye and unwilling goodbye to people or places we love. Uh, it's only one part of the experience that so, so many now over 100 million refugees face as they are forced to leave their lives behind and head into a dangerous future. We'd like to close today's program by sharing a scene from the film When Hitler Stole Pink Rabbit. The movie is based on a children's book written by author and illustrator Judith Carr, in which she draws on her personal experiences as a young Jewish girl. She and her family were forced to flee Germany in the 1930s because of her fa father's public criticism of the Nazi regime. And in this scene from the movie, the family is leaving their home, saying goodbye to their beloved nanny, whom they called Heimpy, uh, not knowing if they would ever see her again, if they would ever return. So we thank you for joining us today. We look forward to seeing you for our next Stay Connected Live program. Bis gleich, Fräulein Heimpel. Bis gleich, Frau Kempe. Thank you. Oh, no.